So let's actually take a look at some of the tools in the geometry ribbon. We've got a full suite of geometry tools. Um, they operate on either nerves or discrete, as I mentioned. But I think the real gem of our workflow is our guided surface and volume repair. Uh, these tools interrogate the entire model to search for problematic areas. And then we present the user with a list of areas uh, that, that need to have uh, some improvement. So we make extensive use of what we call model tours. And that's what you're seeing on the screen here. And this allows you to review each issue individually and scan through the model so that you can focus in on it. And you can click on them to repair them. Or we have a batch repair. So if you click on stitch all in this case, it goes through and it actually repairs all of the, the unstitched edges that it could. It wasn't able to fix them all because some of them were larger than the tolerance. So we're going to switch to our patching tool. And again, we can work through this model tour workflow. And we can click, click on each issue individually as it comes into focus. Or if we want to do it all at once, we can just click on patch all. Once we've done that, all of our issues with free edges are fixed. And now we can see we have a closed shell formed by those services. I'll click on that closed shell in the closed shell tour, and that forms my solid body. And at this point, that solid body corresponds to my structural part. I actually want the fluid part, so I'm gonna use my plug tool. And then I'm gonna click on the cavity that represents the fluid volume, and it automatically creates a solid body out of that. And at this point, I can go through and I can actually create, I'm sorry, delete the structural body and check my model using the validate tool. And as you can see, I've got no issues. The blue check mark indicates that my model is healthy. And that's it. So we've now prepared the, the entire geometry in a very, very simple and, and efficient workflow. Our physics definition workflow also contains some powerful functionality for automatically identifying and managing boundary conditions. For most use cases, you only need to identify inlets, outlets, and rotating bodies. And HyperWorks CFD handles the rest automatically. It processes all of the surfaces that are included in the default boundary condition group to determine if it's an internal surface that requires no boundary condition, an external surface that requires a wall boundary condition, or a sliding interface that requires some type of special interface treatment. So this is a real time saver feature that, that prevents tedious sorting of surfaces on really complex models. <clears throat> We've also got some really nice copy and paste functionality that allow you to copy the properties of one instance of a boundary condition onto another instance. So in this example, uh, you can see that I'm creating my uh, inlet boundary conditions. Uh, so I'm setting a mass flow rate as well as a temperature. We've got a total of four inlets. Uh, so for these subsequent inlets, I'm just gonna click on them to create the boundary condition, but I'm not, notice I'm not entering any values. Now what I do is I copy the properties from my first instance, and then I paste them on to the remaining instances. And what that does is just copies all the parameters that I set in the first instance to the rest of them. And it avoids me from having to uh, type repeatedly the, the same inputs uh, in each of those uh, inlet boundary conditions. And now I've set my outlet boundary condition. I can review my boundary conditions with this uh, color mode called boundaries. And that allows me to quickly see how the model is set up and uh, identify which parts are going to be treated as, as which type of the boundary condition by the solver. Once the physics are defined, uh, mesh controls are applied, and we use the batch meshing tools to create the mesh. When we defined the physics, we had all of our wall boundary conditions uh, stored in, in the default group. And this is the same group on which we're going to want to assign our boundary layer mesh controls to. So we can simply recall that selection list through our advanced selection dialog. And I'll illustrate that in the video here. So here, I click on advanced select. And then the default wall is the boundary condition group where all of my wall boundary condition existed. So you can see that I'm able to quickly recall that, and now I can enter my parameters for the wall boundary, boundary layer uh, growth. Another nice characteristic we have is that we constantly provide you with feedback regarding the mesh size and the scale of the model. So here I'm getting ready to launch the batch measure. And if you look at the bounding box of the model, you can see that there are some dots along the axes of it. And those dots il illustrate the current nodal spacing that's set by the mesh control. So in this case, I've reduced the mesh size to 0 0.0005 uh, meters. And when I zoom in on that, you can see that what that spacing corresponds to. So this allows you to avoid uh, issues where you may have completely different model scales that don't make sense for the mesh controls that you've, that you've got set. 
Uh, and again, it's another instance where we provide continuous feedback to the user uh, about the state of the model, and it really adds up to a lot of time savings and a lot of convenience. So the meshing is done as a batch process. Uh, once the mesh is complete, it's automatically loaded, and we can then investigate it in the graphics window. Uh, we can also draw cut planes. So if you want to take a section cut of the model and take a look at, say, the boundary layers on the interior or the volume elements, uh, we can do that using some of the tools that, that we provide for you in the graphics window. So the final step in our workflow is to define any solution monitors that you're interested in, assign the initial conditions, and then launch the solver. We've really done our homework on this aspect of the workflow as well. Uh, for most models, you can rely on the default initialization, uh, but for some applications, such as uh, transient conjugate heat transfer simulations or multi-phase sloshing applications, it is important to have a, a full set of tools that support selection of parts, regions within parts, et cetera. So we have provided all this uh, capability to you in the solution ribbon. Uh, we've also got some really nice plotting capabilities that show you the time history of, of different variables in the solution. Uh, but the plots are updated in real time as the, the results are streaming in. So in this video, I'm just illustrating the selection of a few uh, solution monitors. So I set some surface monitors and I set some uh, volume monitors. That's gonna give me access to the temperatures and the pressures, uh, both within the volume as well as on the surfaces. Um, here's an illustration of the log file monitoring tool. So if the simulation was actually running in real time, we would see the log file from the solver displayed here and we can uh, review that to, to see what the state of the model is. The plotting tool's got some predefined plots already for you, uh, so it's very easy to investigate the residuals uh, of the simulation. And then you can also derive your own quantities. Uh, so here I've created the derived quantity of the outlet temperature. Because we set that solution monitor, I can click on that outlet temperature tab, and then I can see the, uh, the outlet temperature. And those plots do update as the simulation progresses, so you can monitor your solution real time as it's evolving.